Welcome to the Chapter 3 Overview of First Civilizations, 3500 BCE to 500 BCE. Chapter Main Idea, beginning about 5,000 years ago, civilizations were created in six major locations around the world, transforming the way humans live their lives. Let's start by talking about the relevance of the information in this chapter. These early civilizations answer questions that we still answer today. How to keep order in a society, how to organize an economy so that the needs of a community are provided for, how to legitimize the authority of the ruler. As we will see, many of the answers these early civilizations provided 5,000 years ago have helped to shape our world today. Here's a picture of the Code of Hammurabi, which, as the chapter will point out, had a great impact on the Judeo-Christian tradition, just to pick one example. Setting the stage, this map you saw in Chapter 2, it shows independent breakthroughs to agriculture in the purple and the spread of agriculture with the arrows. And remember that agriculture is the cradle of civilization, and with the exception of pastoral communities, it's a surplus of food that allows civilization to take root. In chapter 2, you learned about these independent breakthroughs, and it's no accident that the first civilizations you'll learn about in this chapter correspond to the development of agriculture. So if you compare this map with this one from chapter 3, you'll see that in the Americas, we have the Norte Chico civilization here, and we have the Olmec civilization here. And if you look back at this map, the um, Olmec civilizations in Mesoamerica and the Norte Chico in the Andean region, both which had independent breakthroughs to agriculture, just to pick one example. Once a society settles down and produces surplus food, it can begin to develop the basic requirements for civilization, such as a specialization of labor, which means that different people are assigned different tasks, a consistent set of laws, and a security apparatus. So the first red heading is called Something New, the Emergence of Civilization. Here's a main idea statement for this red heading. The first civilizations formed for a variety of reasons that depended on local conditions and shared a tendency towards urbanization. The first blue heading is called Introducing the First Civilizations. Between 3500 BCE and 3000 BCE, three civilizations developed independently. Mesopotamia, which is here in what we call the Middle East, and that began with the Sumerian civilization, the Egyptian civilization here along the Nile River, and the Norte Chico civilization, as we mentioned, over here in Peru. In Norte Chico, archaeologists have uncovered evidence of urbanization, trade, and communication using the quipu, see page 101 for review of writing systems. Much later, three other civilizations appeared. By 2000 BCE in the Indus Valley, in what is now Pakistan, this civilization is mysterious to us, largely because we cannot read its script. There seems to have been a lack of political hierarchy, but it does seem clear that the society was weakened by a negative impact humans had on the environment. As you read this chapter, look for examples of civilizations declining due to human impacts such as soil erosion and deforestation. The next civilization the book reviews is the Chinese civilization here. These show a much stronger evidence of a centralized state. We have the Xia the Shang and the Zhao dynasties, all enlarged the power and presence of a central state, beginning one of the great political powers in world history. And the last civilization is the Olmec civilization in present-day southern Mexico, over here, which we refer to as Mesoamerica. For this civilization, look for examples of monumental architecture, especially giant statues. There are clear connections between the Olmecs and the later Mesoamerican civilizations, such as the Maya. So this section reviews those civilizations and spends more time in the in future sections looking at Egypt and the um, Mesopotamian civilizations. The next heading is called the question of origins. The development of civilization was a gradual process and resulted from a response to challenges rather than a master plan on the part of the residents of each part of the world. Look for the theory of Robert Carnero on page 92 as a good summary of the main motivations for creating civilization. Essentially, they come down to three things. Food, and that's what this graph here is showing about irrigation in Egypt. Security and power. And the last heading in this section is called an urban revolution. All of these civilizations urbanized. Your book will give examples from Mesopotamia, a city called Uruk, the Indus Valley, Mohenjo-Daro is shown here in this picture, and a future time period city in Mesoamerica called Teotihuacan. Cities were an important feature of these civilizations because they were the centers of political power. They produced a unifying culture, and they were economic centers as well. 
And again, the big theme of this chapter is what are the requirements of a civilization in order to survive? And one of the features of these civilizations is the erosion of equality. Here's a main idea statement. A distinguishing feature common to early civilizations was a movement away from the egalitarian societies of the Paleolithic era to social and political hierarchies. Hierarchies of class. The common causes of the formation of civilizations also created inequalities. It was in the interest of early states to perpetuate these inequalities as they provided a framework for the exercise of political power, social organization, and economic productivity. The surplus production of the lower classes supported the upper classes in a variety of ways, through taxes and rents, through required labor, and through slavery, which is as old as civilization itself. This picture shows slavery in Egypt. So again, the point here is that when civilizations form, they tend to break down into hierarchies, and that is a common feature of civilizations, even though they developed independently around the world. So pay attention as you're reading this section for what what it is about civilizations that would create hierarchies automatically. Hierarchies of gender. All these civilizations develop patriarchy, and this section reviews various theories to explain this phenomenon. They include an increasingly labor-intensive agricultural work, which placed more importance on the role of men, the availability of men to fulfill specialized roles outside the home, which held more status than working in the home, and the growing importance of warfare to protect the interests of the state. As we journey through world history, patriarchy will be a recurring theme all the way up to the 19th century, and for many people, into the 21st. Patriarchy in practice. This section starts with some examples of patriarchy in Mesopotamia that demonstrate the ways in which the state controlled the behavior and power of women. It then compares patriarchy in Mesopotamia to that in Egypt, which, while still a patriarchy, allowed slightly more power for women and recognized equality in relationships, this photo at the beginning of the chapter is an example of what appears to be a devoted, love-based relationship. This section reminds us that in world history, things are often more complex than we first recognize. We can describe all these civilizations as patriarchies, but there were degrees within that classification. The next heading is called the rise of the state. Early states employed a variety of methods to maintain control over increasingly large and complex societies. The first section is called coercion and consent. This important section points out the sources of authority for early states. It's important to remember that you can't have civilization without an authoritative state, and that 5,000 years ago it was not universally accepted that people should obey a ruler who is not related to them. Rulers tended to be supported by upper classes and or the military, whose privileged status depended on a functioning powerful state capable of organizing increasingly complex tasks, such as the construction of this ziggurat in Mesopotamia. Religion was also very important, as many rulers derived their authority from the gods. Your book discusses China, Mesopotamia, and Egypt as examples of rulers ruling on the basis of divine authority. Next, the importance of writing and accounting. A critical tool of state organization was the development of writing, which developed independently in many places. Be sure to study the snapshot on page 101 for more detail. This picture is Sumerian cuneiform. Writing reinforced the status of literate elites helped to organize the economy and cultural traditions, and communicated laws, as in Hammurabi's code. The ability to communicate in writing helped to link together larger civilizations, which were linked by connections other than tribal kinship. So remember, these first civilizations are making a transition from family or clan-based organization into larger and larger organization, and the communication that writing allows is an important tool in that transition. The grandeur of kings. It was reasonable for a commoner to question the authority of rulers of early states. For thousands of years, political power had been based in kinship groups, and now a far-flung ruler demanded submission. This section briefly reviews the sources of authority. They include a lavish lifestyle, impressive rituals, and monumental architecture, such as the Olmec head shown in this picture. Each of these served to impress commoners with the power of the ruler, helping to reinforce their authority. The last section is called Comparing Mesopotamia and Egypt. While connected culturally and economically, Mesopotamia and Egypt had significant differences that demonstrate the diversity of early civilizations. Environment and Culture The following three sections are a good example of a comparison. Look for similarities and differences organized by spice theme as you read, and think about how you could think this way when you analyze world history. The first section looks at interaction between humans and the environment and culture. Both of these societies depended on rivers for life. 
the Tigris and Euphrates rivers here were the cradle of life for the Mesopotamian civilization. And the Nile River here was the cradle of life for the Egyptian civilization. The Nile reliably flooded each year, giving a, re a reliable source of irrigation for agriculture and contributing to a generally more positive outlook and more stable political situation. In Mesopotamia, extensive irrigation led to salinization of the soil and a weakening of the state due to low agricultural production. And this demonstrates connections between the environment and political stability. Next, cities and states. This section reviews political differences between Mesopotamia and Egypt. The Sumerian culture was not one unified state, but a collection of cities, each ruled by its own king. We call these city-states. There is a weakness in this arrangement, for individual cities tend to fight with each other, and they are often left weaker and exposed to conquest from the outside. In the case of Mesopotamia, the Sumerians were conquered by the Akkadians, then the Babylonians, and then the Assyrians. Egypt enjoyed much more stability and was a single state ruled by a pharaoh. The identification of natural phenomena, such as the flooding of the Nile, shown in this picture, with the power of the pharaoh helped the Egyptian state last for over 3,000 years. A combination of environmental changes and a more powerful noble class weakened the authority of the state. As you read this section, look for reasons that the Egyptians were a more lasting civilization than the Sumerians. And finally, interaction and exchange. It's common in world history for trade connections to diffuse culture as well, and this was the case with Mesopotamia and Egypt. Mesopotamian culture influenced Hebrews and Phoenicians in the Mediterranean region, and the Nile Delta, remember, is in the Mediterranean Sea, so Egypt also had interaction with Mediterranean cultures to the north, as well as with the Nubian culture to the south, which is what this picture shows. This section reviews these connections and ends with a discussion of pastoral people such as the Hittites and the Hyksos, who challenged states in Mesopotamia and Egypt with their superior ironworking and chariot technology. This is a very important theme that we will return to frequently, which is the challenges of pastoral people and the advanced warfare that they have due to their unique culture. And now we'll review the spice themes of the chapter. Patriarchy characterized the organization of societies in the six regions that developed the first civilizations. Rulers mobilized resources in service to the state and built larger empires with a variety of methods. Interactions with pastoralists brought new military technology to these civilizations. Monumental architecture and record keeping helped to unify societies and trade expanded, bringing cultures into contact with one another. Finally, a visual summary of the chapter. Here we have the first civilizations, and in Asia, you had China and the Indus Valley. In the Mediterranean region, you have Mesopotamia and Egypt. And in the Americas, you have Norte Chico and the Olmec. And each of these really had similar causes for forming. And they include divine authority, a surplus of food, a social hierarchy, some system of writing, urban planning and urbanization, and increasing trade and trade connections. That's the chapter three overview. Happy reading. For I have been shown to rule ruling all things, thinking the world was mine to live by. I breathe in the promise of made in man. But each has their own.